Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of Huddle 3 Group. And today I'm pleased to uh, welcome a fellow Australian onto the show, Gary Ridge. So Gary's the uh, chairman of WD40, the founder of The Learning Moment, the culture coach. He's, he's a busy guy and uh, he's got a great story. So Gary, uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> G'day, Dane. It's great to be with you. And you know, I, I take that word busy. You know, I, I don't like that word busy. I say I have a, 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 an abundance of worthwhile work. Yeah. I, I, I see that. I see that in a lot of your postings and, um, and that abundance mindset is very evident. A lot of passion, a lot of joy that you're bringing to team members and to those that you collaborate in the ecosystem with. Yeah. Well, you know, life's a gift. Don't send it back unwrapped. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So tell us, Gary, a little bit more about you, you know, an Australian guy running this big company here in the US the last, what, 25 years? Yeah, I, uh, I've been grateful and privileged to be the CEO of WD40 Company, which is a US public company for 25 years. One of the publications in Australia that you would know, the Australian Financial Review wrote an article a little while back. And they, uh, they said that I was the longest serving Australian of a US public company. So that's, I guess that says something, um, what it is. Yeah. But, you know, I was born in Sydney, grew up in a little suburb of Sydney called Five Dock, went to Tremoyne Boys High School, left school, uh, was uh, interested in retailing, worked for a retailing organization in Australia that was pretty well known back then called Walton's, not in business anymore. I actually have a, a certificate in modern retailing dated 1972, which I'm sure is quite outdated now. But from there, I um, I uh, worked for a, uh, a wholesaling company in sales and marketing and eventually ended up working at a company called Hawker Pacific, which was the licensee for WD-40 and Armour All in Australia. And that's how I got right. to know the people at WD-40 Company. And... Um, Back in 1987, uh, the license was coming to an end and the company was really getting curious about building the brand globally and they invited me to join them, which which I did on July 4th, 1987, uh, with a fax machine under my bed. That's how I opened the Australian subsidiary. And I worked wow. for about six months putting the company together and we launched in January 1988. Uh, and I worked out of Australia, mostly in Asia from 88 to 94. And then in 94, I was having a conversation with my then boss, who was the president of the company. And I said, is there anything else you'd like me to do? And he said, you want to move to the US? And I said, to do what? And he said, to help us take the blue and yellow can with a little red top to the world. And I thought, that sounds pretty exciting. When's the next flight? Well, it wasn't that simple. But uh, <laughs> I moved it, moved over in 1994. Uh, and uh, he retired three years later in 1997. And uh, for some reason... The board of directors then of a U.S. public company thought this Aussie guy who'd never been to Wall Street might be okay at uh, leading a U.S. organization. So, and that's where it all started. Twenty-five years yep. later, um, well, here we are. It's been quite a journey. Congratulations! I mean, it's a it's a great story, and I love just before the show, you and I were talking, and you said, "Well, that's the twenty-five year apprenticeship." So, tell us a little bit more about, you know the 25-year apprenticeship and where you're focusing your passion and energy now. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm true about that. I feel like the 25 years I've just spent has really put me where I would need to be to make the big difference I, I think I can make. And I, I, I call it the 25 years apprenticeship in leadership. And in fact, just before our call, I was on the phone with uh, my my writing partner were writing a book called The Learning Moment, you know, 25 Learning Moments Over 25 Years. And it's Great. going to talk about, you know, the experiences and what I call scar tissue that I had along the way um, because life is just a learning journey and uh, um, I was fortunate enough to have that journey. So now, you know, I truly believe that business has the biggest opportunity ever to make a positive difference in the world. And I often say, imagine a place where you go to work every day, you make a contribution to something bigger than yourself, you yeah. learn something new, you're protected and set free by a compelling set of values and you go home happy. Happy people create happy families, happy families create happy communities and happy communities create yeah. a happy world. And Dane, I don't think you or anyone would argue with me that a little happier world right now might be a good thing. And unfortunately, yeah. you know, around us we have 
all this toxic leadership that creates these cultures that people don't like. And, uh, you know, I wrote an article on in LinkedIn a few months ago called The Great Escape. There's a lot of talk yep. about the great resignation. This is not the great resignation. People are escaping these toxic cultures where they don't feel like they belong. They're not treated with respect and dignity. There's not an opportunity for continuous learning. That's not a purpose that they feel is bigger than themselves and they feel proud about talking about. And it doesn't yep. have to be that way. Um, and I'm looking forward now to helping leaders identify the elements of culture that they need to pay attention to, to build cultures where people actually say, I love going to work here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm energized just listening to that. And I was reading on your LinkedIn profile, you had the Aristotle quote there too, which was what, 384 BC, I think you noted, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. and yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. And and perfection in the work, as you've just said, allows people to go home happy, allows people to contribute to happy, healthy families, happy, healthy communities, actually play a role in those communities. I think, sadly, business um, over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years has been kind of a sit on the fence. You come here, your job, boom. We don't really talk politics. We don't talk religion. We don't get involved in what's happening in the world. And there seems to be a bit of a shift happening driven by people. I think people are, are bringing, naturally, there's a talent shortage, but people are bringing or, or commanding, I think, more um, time from their employers on what's important to them. Well, I think, you know, we all wish COVID wouldn't have happened, right? But there's been some great learning moments from COVID. Yeah. And the first big learning moment is it, it gave leaders a slap up the side of the head Yeah, because people were saying to them, you know, before COVID, I went to work and we know the dismal employee engagement numbers that have been out there for decades. Yeah. You know, how many times have we read year after year that, you know, 70% of people who go to work every day are either disengaged or actively disengaged. And the, the amount of damage that does, not only to the people but to the businesses, is enormous. And we've just gone, oh, okay, yeah, we should do something about that, shouldn't we? Yeah. Well, COVID hit and the 70% of people who were disengaged said, I, I can't handle this anymore because my life is disengaged. Yeah. COVID has sent me into a roller coaster ride, so something's got to give here. And a lot of them said the give is I'm not going to come to work here anymore because I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And leaders have to wake up to that and we can fix that in certain ways. Can't, can't do it anymore is a very interesting use of language. Um, it's not I don't want to do it anymore. Um, it's I can't do it anymore. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think that COVID, like you say it, it, it really threw a lot of people, a lot of communities into a state of shock and survival. And, and we became in a survival mode much more aware of what we could and couldn't do and what the toll was rather than just kind of living in this numb state. Um, so it is, I think it's real. I think people can't do it. You can't engage them with ping pong tables or you know trips to the beach. Um, you've got to think about why can't they do it and how can we change so I'm, I'm intrigued if you think about that capacity to do something where you see businesses being able to, with your learning moments, where you see businesses being able to start unlocking that formula um, so that people can do it and want to do it. So let's think about the four pillars that I think the business need to think about. The first one is care. Mm -hmm. And care means your ego is being eaten by your empathy. Your empathy isn't being eaten by your ego. Yeah. And, and care means not only rewarding and applauding people for doing great work, it's being brave enough to redirect people when they're playing the game but not winning because of the way they're playing. And so often we, tr we protect our own comfort zone yeah. at the expense of, of other people's development. Now, I know we're both Aussie, so we, we we got a, we've got something in common here. We know what rugby is, right? Yeah. So let's look at let's look at this through the eyes of rugby for a minute. Let's assume that 
we are now the coaches of a great rugby team. So what's the responsibility of the coach? Number one is great coaches don't run onto the field and pick up the ball. No. Great coaches don't go to the podium to pick up the prize. What does a great coach do? A great coach spends time on the sideline observing the play with one objective only. That is to be able to advise the players how a different way of playing will help them win the game. Now, let's say one player in that game is not playing the best game. If we, if that coach protects their own comfort zone by not redirecting that player, who loses? The whole team loses. Mm -hmm. The whole team loses. Mm -hmm. So the number one responsibility of a coach in caring is not only to be the cheerleader and, and okay, maybe a critic, but to redirect play. And that's so important. Yeah. The second thing is not only staying on the sideline, but great coaches spend a lot of time in the locker room. And what are they doing in the locker room? They're build, helping build trust amongst the players. Yeah. You know, you've probably read that great book, Legacy, written many years ago about the All Blacks and oh, yeah. how, you know, they used to make them sweep out the, the the locker room and do the things they need to do to make sure they were bat bonding together. So the first thing is care. Yeah. Brave enough to love, brave enough to redirect, and also not being selfish, which is protecting your own comfort zone. The second one is candor. Yeah. No lying, no faking, no hiding. Most people in organisations don't lie. What do they do? They fake and hide. Why? Because they're afraid. There, there's fear of failure. That's why there's the, the, you have to have the power of the learning moment. Yeah. And what's the power of the learning moment? A positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared with all people. Yeah. The third pillar is accountability. What are you and I going to hold each other accountable for? And I tell you, most people let people down in life because there's not clarity around what are we holding each other accountable for? Yeah. So it's important that we know that. And the fourth one is responsibility. Are we brave enough to hold ourselves responsible for what really should happen? So care, candor, accountability, responsibility. Yeah. Four pillars to look at building strong cultures within an organization. Yeah, and those, interestingly, are all very behavioral. So it doesn't really come down to how you design a job. It comes down to how you agree to operate together first and foremost. Absolutely. Yeah. And as you said, you know, great culture isn't about popcorn pizzas and, and singing Kumbaya on a Friday. Yeah. It's not about that. No. It's not about no. that. That's also the really hard stuff to achieve because in a sports environment, you've got a structured, you do have a field, you've got a locker room, you've got competition that plays a game in a certain format. Um, in business, it's never quite as simple as that. So as you think about those four pillars, Gary, and the, the 25 learning moments, not give too much away on the book, but are there any great examples of, of where you've been able to come in and, and interject a bit of care or candor into a team or into a, 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 a business unit or, or something that really stands out in your mind? Yeah, I think there's also what, what, language do you have in an organization that gives you the permission to act around those things and at wd-40 company our second value in the company was we value creating positive lasting memories in all of our relationships yeah and i can recall a time when i was in a meeting one morning and someone was not creating positive lasting memories and and it was very out of character for this person that you know you've, you've probably been in one of those meetings Dave, where yeah. someone's sucking the energy out of the room yeah. and you don't understand why so you know what do you do well the first thing is you do nothing yeah that's not going to work because you're not going to you know redirect or be able to encourage the person the second thing is you act on at the time so you say hey dane yeah. you know look smarten yourself up mate you know it's that's not the way to behave in this meeting well that eh, don't do that either because everyone else in the room is going when am i going to get hit with that brick yeah so if you were to reflect on the values in the organization what would you do so at the end of the meeting, I said to this person, hey, let's go for a walk. So we walked outside that building and I'm looking, you know, under a car and in a trash can and behind a tree. And he said, what the hell are you doing? I said, I'm looking for you. He said, what do you mean? The you I know and love was not in that room today. Yeah. 
what's on your mind, what's up. So there's a way of, you know, doing that. And, and let me share another you know, real a real learning I had. You know, when I was back in Australia in high school, many, 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 many years ago, of course, I went to Des Moines Boys High School mm-hmm. and I had a science teacher. And that science teacher one day gave us a Petri dish and they said, we're going to grow culture in this Petri dish. And, I said, that was, and this is a true story. I thought, well, that's interesting. So what's important? Well, the first thing is what are the ingredients that you put in the Petri dish to grow the culture you want to grow? So my question to the people listening today is, if you're going to grow great culture in the organisation, are you very clear what those ingredients should be? Yeah. And they are things like values, purpose, behaviours. Okay, so then what do you need to do once you've got the 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 ingredients in the petri dish you've got to watch that petri dish every day and you've got to make sure that you're feeding the good ingredients to grow but you're also watching very closely for the toxins yeah. that could get in the petri dish that's going to kill the good ingredients very quickly yeah so again you know one of my my kind of learning moments is this culture thing is perpetual it's it's simple it's not easy, but there's an algorithm. Culture equals values plus behavior times consistency. And a lot of organizations don't understand that this is about consistency. You don't run in and sprinkle fairy dust over an organization, change the culture and walk away and say, good on you, mate. It's all good for the future. It's a day by day by day by day effort. Yeah. And that has to cascade down, not just from the leader, the CEO. You've got to find the ways to build it into each team leader, each team member. Yeah. It's got to be embedded. Yeah. It's got to be embedded in them. And that's where the values in the organization are so important. If you've got a clearly defined set of hierarchical values, they became the written reminders of the only acceptable behavior in the organization and the way people need to think about making decisions. Yeah. And those are what you use every day to help you guard the ingredients in the Petri dish. Yeah. No, I love that. And and on the way people make decisions every day in the business, is that while you might have core values, you might have core behaviors, is there something more structural there from department to department? Does an engineering or a product department have a different way of sharing data, making decisions than, say, the sales and marketing team? I think the core of making the decisions is the same. It's got to be based on on the values in the organization. Yeah. You know, I'll give you another example, and this will be from purchasing, if you will. So our number one value in the company is we value doing the right thing. And how does and our number six value is we value creating uh, we value sustaining the WD40 economy, which is about profitability. Yeah. So we have a man a mandate in the company that says we will have no cancer causing chemicals in any product we make. Yeah. And and that's a mandate. So we could have someone go to our purchasing department and say, hey, you know, you're using chemical X. If you use chemical Y, it's less expensive and you can be more profitable by using this product. Oh, the only thing is you'd have to put a Prop 65 warning on your can. Yeah. The person in the, in the purchasing department using our hierarchical values as their guide has no hesitation saying, thank you so much for that suggestion, but we won't be doing that because our number one value is we value doing the right thing and our mand- mandatory says that. Yeah. Now, if we didn't have those values in place, what would be happening? Oh, wait a minute, let me call my supervisor. Let's go up the chain. Hey, we can make th- this whole debate would happen. Why don't we do this? Because we can make more money. Yeah. But because the values are in place, it stops churn. The conversation's over. You give them that confidence and that clarity to act. Yeah. Yeah. Permission. Permission. Remember what I said a set of, I said, imagine a place you go to work where you had a set of values that protected people and set them free. Yes. Allowed them to make the decisions, empowering them to do what the, we need to do because the values are guiding them without them having to go quacking up the hierarchy to get some decision. Yeah. Yeah. I love the set them free and actually that reinforces exactly what you meant by that at the opening. Um, and that, that actually kind of takes us into a, a different realm, which is innovation. Right now, a lot of companies are looking for innovation. That's not necessarily product innovation. It might be innovation in the way they 
run their meetings and the way that they engage with customers, manage data. But the more and more you read and you look at where good innovation comes from, it doesn't come from the CEO or a brains trust in the middle of an organization. It comes from people out on the fringes. And I've always observed with WD40, uh, you know, that the product and the role of the people that are using the product in the field is something that you've always celebrated. You know, perhaps you could touch on where you've seen some good innovations from your teams because you've had this this set of values, this set of behaviors that that protects and sets people free to come up with ideas regardless of their role in the team. Well, I'll go back to quoting one of our, our values. One of our values is we value making it better than it is today. Yeah. That's one of our values. So we're consi- continuously looking for ways of making it better while living our purpose, which is we exist to create positive, lasting memories, solving problems in factories, homes, and workshops around the world. Yeah. One of our biggest and most successful innovations has been our delivery system. Uh-huh. And you know, years ago, if you bought a can of WD-40, it had a little red tube attached to the side of the can, and you'd have to take the tube and put it into the actuator. Yeah. And when we talked to our end users, they said, if you could make this easier for us, so that we could get our job done quicker, we would really appreciate it and we would value that. So we initially developed our smart straw delivery system, which attaches the the straw to the can in its uh, lockdown position. It sprays normally. When you flip it up, it locks out and it comes out of the, the red tube. So a mechanic who's working on a car in a garage that has to get the car in and out and the quicker he gets it in and out, the more productive he is. Yep. Now it doesn't have to look for the little red tube. And then on top of that, later on, we developed the same type of delivery system, but with an eight inch flexible tube on it. So if that same mechanic had a car up on a hoist and he had a bolt that was behind a manifold that he needed to get some penetrant to to loosen, yep. now he can do it quickly without waste saving time it's better for the uh, for him it's better for the environment it's better for everybody so by by living our purpose mm-hmm. and using our values our end users tell us how we can deliver better value to them and then that becomes a win win for everybody yeah that's a great story actually i did see one of your videos when you bought out the flexi tube on the on the can and uh, that was a cool video the um that's it's an interesting theme in teamwork because we had a guest on the team recently called Kian Goha, and Kian talks about innovation out there in the community and teaming out, which means it's not just your employees, it's your customers, it's your vendors, suppliers, um, and there's a perfect example of where everyday users are, are giving feedback um, to make your product stand out against the rest. Yeah, well, we do a thing. I think it's called ethnology. I can't. I, ne- I can never pronounce it. Yeah, but it's where we actually go into the environment where our product's being used, and we watch it being used in real life time, and identify with the end users ways we can create a better product. Um, another great example is our WD forty um, spray and stay gel. We had our end users tell us. We love WD-40, but could you help us with a product that doesn't drip because we want to get into position in situations where we we don't want it to drip after we apply it. We said, we think we can do that if three years later, we come up with a product called WD-40 Spray and Stay Gel. It's the original WD-40, but it's in a format when you spray it on to a a hinge, it sticks. And now it doesn't drip anymore. Now, our end users, gave us that that vision yeah that's neat are there any examples where you had the suppliers um, downstream uh, being invited into the team any of those uh you know delivery systems where you're having to bring in people that are not wd40 to come up with components or oh yeah absolutely we we don't manufacture anything right we 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 outsource all our so all of the technology that had to go in develop, we have our, our R&D center in New Jersey where we have, I think we have 14 scientists in the, in the tribe globally, um, but they more are more the orchestrators of the work that needs to be done by outside parties. So we had 
you know, top quality engineering firms helping us design you know, the, the, what we needed to design uh, to make the dyes that needed to be made for the equipment to, yep. to all of that. So we, we rely heavily on the expertise of those outside. Neat. So that's, it's interesting. We've had a few guests on when we talk about teamwork and they talk about the difficulties of teaming up with someone who's not part of your organization. They don't have your values, your behaviors, you know, ingrained in the way that they operate. How do you extend that if you're partnering with those folks for engineering and design? Is is that part of your onboarding and selection process for for those partners? Is it part of your continuous kind of project management effort? Well, one of the first things we do with any any organization is we put them through a values alignment. And if people are not, if we don't, we can't work with anybody who's not aligned with our values. Got it. And the second thing is, is there's nothing like the freedom of a tightly defined brief. So we want to make sure that our brief is tightly defined and, and you know, whenever we have a, a RFP, part of the RFP is a values uh, assessment. Yeah. Um, do, do, it, it, that's so important. Um, and there's been a couple of times where we failed on something because we didn't do a good job yeah. in the initial stages of really making sure that the values of the person we, or the company we're working with were aligned with and compatible with ours. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Not easy to do, but if you've got in the first place your behaviors and your values well set in your corporation, it's the job's halfway done, I guess. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have trouble aligning values because they're not clear about what their values are. And unfortunately, there's a lot of companies that have values and they frame them and stick them up on a wall and they point at them. Yeah. But they, but if you were to observe the behavior in the organization, it wouldn't match the values. Yeah, uh, absolutely. One, um, I guess while we're just finalizing that sort of theme on values and behavior, we talked about innovation, we talked about a few different things. How do you uh, celebrate those values within the company? Is there anything that you've landed on over the years that really works? Yeah. Um, so I wrote a book a number of years ago with Dr. Ken Blanchard, the <laughs> One Minute Manager, and um, it's called Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A. Um, and in that book, we talk about how we integrate our values into our quarterly conversations with all of our tribe members. Yeah. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that every quarter when we sit down and have our formal conversation, which is a time when I'm here for you and you're here for me, we ask our, our tribe members to share with us how they've lived our values in the last 90 days. And we only have two measurements of that. You either live them or you visit them. And we don't want a lot of visitors. We want a lot of people who live them. So people talk about how they've actually lived these certain things uh, in, in our organization. That's cool. Living and visiting. So visiting is just not being there enough? It's, it's, it's randomly using them. Got it. Got it. No, that makes sense. And any particular sort of awards, uh, we just did our culture circle, which we do once a year when we bring all of our Huddle 3 group companies together and we recognize people's contributions where they have lived a value or a behavior. Um, did you find that that was a part of the story? Absolutely. We have a number yeah. of awards within the company, whether it be, you know, the CEO coin of values driving behavior to our people's choice awards to a number of different things that we do within the organization. So, yeah, we, we, we reward and applaud people for yeah. living our values. Yeah, I love, I love the applaud adding that in because that's probably the bigger part. The reward's nice, but it's when they see all of their colleagues stand up and recognize them and give them the high five, the pat on the back, the cuddle. That, that's a winner. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Public recognition of great behavior. Yeah. So as you move forwards now, Gary, the new book, um, obviously all of this technology that we've seen infiltrating the way that we work, particularly post-COVID, what are your you know hopes? What it, What is it that excites you about uh, helping other companies kind of emulate some of the successes that you're able to design and deliver at WD40? 
what excites me is we've proven at WD40 Company over 25 years that by adopting a, a principle around having a highly engaged workforce with a culture with a competitive advantage, it benefits the people in the organization. 98% of our people globally say they love to tell people they work at WD40 Company. And we operate yeah. in 17 countries around the world. We have a 93% employee engagement. 97% of people say they trust their coach, which is their, their boss. So, you know, we've proven that we can not only have, you know, positively impact people's lives by, by having them you know, work in an organization where they're respected and, and rewarded, but as a, a company, it's beneficial to the company because we've, you know, we've had a compounded annual growth rate of total shareholder return over 25 years of 14%. Our market cap's gone from, you know, 300 million to 2.5 billion. And during that time, we've taken our revenue from plus or minus 100 million to way over 500 million. Yeah, that's huge. They're big numbers. And compound annual growth at 14% through those peaks and troughs is, is uh, pretty outstanding. Yeah. What do you yeah. um, and it's all about the people. All about the people. So it's interesting. You've achieved that at WD forty. People are excited about it. We do a lot of work in the hydrocarbons industry, and a lot of our customers come and talk to us about we're losing mid career talent like never before. You know, if you're a traditional oil and gas company and you're not investing in a renewables asset portfolio, that there's this social burden on the people. Um, when you start to think about those companies that are there's some great companies, great balance sheets, good leaders in place, but they're fairly entrenched in markets that are getting a lot of um, disruption right now because of the the environmental focus, the ESG movement. Um, where where do those companies begin so that they can start getting their employees to feel excited and proud and not hiding that they work at a refinery or a place um, you know that that may not carry the same public recognition? Uh, as some other products or industries? Well, you know, I think the whole question of ESG is interesting. And, uh, you know, as Larry Fink has said, this is not going from brown to green. This is a series of, of changing colours along the way. So I think the first thing is, is the, is the organisations have clarity around this is where we are and that that's reality and this is where we're going and we're, pr- we're going to be, you know, proactive and proud about our journey along the way. Yeah. Um, but not everything is going to be in this world, you know, um, if we want to get back to zero, 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 well, let's go and, you know, live like I'm the caveman. Um, yeah. So there's, there's, there's variations of this. But I think what's important is it's such an important topic that we're paying more and more attention to. So we will progressively make the world a better place if we're all doing our bit to do that. Yeah. And and I think, as you say, owning it up front, this is where we are. This is where we're going. It's, it's probably something that's not being said. That's, that's silent in a lot of organizations right now. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. This is where we are. Okay. We're here. Yeah. And we've, it, we, we admit it and this is where we're back. More importantly, this is where we're going. Yeah. And that's probably a, that probably hits all four of your pillars. I was just looking back over that. It's care, it's, it's candor, it's accountability, it's responsibility. It's all four. Yeah. So you've given absolutely. them the playbook. <laughs> <laughs> that's Excellent. neat. And, and on the technology piece, you know, as you start to see uh, – more technology, more AI, more machine learning coming into organizations. Have you got any views on, you know, how people and machines start to play roles together? I mean, you've seen a fair bit of technology uh, advancement in your time at WD40. Is, is there anything to take anecdotally there that, that might point towards the future? Okay, you know, you just reminded me. I remembered early, early in my days when I was living in Australia and traveling up to Asia, you know, I'd get on my flight and I'd land in Hong Kong and uh, 
I'd get out, get out of the, the the plane, and I'd get into my hotel, and I'd arrive, and there'd be you know a bunch of faxes, and I'd have to read all the faxes, I'd have to write out my answers of the faxes, I'd take it down to the business center, I'd stand in line at the business center, I'd wait to send this, and off it would go, and you know then I'd go get a glass of wine. <laughs> um, with technology today, the plane lands, and by the time you're at the gate, you've answered all those questions, and you just go get a glass of wine. <laughs> so you know. I, <laughs> I, I, I think what it is is that you know, technology is is empowering us to um, gather knowledge. The thing that I'm worried about a little bit is is you know the the addiction to what is real. Um, yeah, there's, there was a great book called written called "Who Moved My Cheese," and a follow on to that book was is called "Out of the Maze," and. And the, in Out of the Maze, they talk about him and her, he and her who were the, well, him and her were the, the two mice that were caught in this maze. And they, they talk about how they escaped from the maze. But, but one of the key messages is in that book is notice your beliefs and ask yourself this question, why do I believe what I believe? And I think in technology and particularly in information sharing these days, we need to really question ourselves around that. Why do we believe what we believe? On the other side, AI is going to you know, give us better data quicker that we're going to be able to analyze better to make better decisions. Yeah. So I think it's, it's pretty exciting when you think about it. You know, I remember my old dad, you know, when he, he was an engineer, he worked for one company for, for uh, 50 years. Yep. And I remember when fax, so he, he was a pretty smart guy. And this goes back hundreds of um, tens of years ago when he was alive and, and fax machines came out and we were having a conversation. And he said, how do they get the paper through the wires? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah, okay, look how things have changed. It, it is amazing. Um, and I like the way that you described that arriving in Hong Kong story because we were at a conference recently. Uh, we had a speaker, keynote speaker, Heather McGowan, talking to us. And she was saying that um, we're moving into this human value era because the technology allows us to take humans out of the reams of paper and you know responding when they're in a market when they could be spending time with customers and team members, whether that's over a wine or out on a plant walk down. Um, so it does it does create more opportunity for humans to do what we're best at, which is connecting, really. Which is which is to be with other humans. Yeah. We're social animals. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that that is that's a both an optimistic view and a, and a necessarily uh, concerning view on on the data and where people's beliefs and, and positions are coming from. Uh, that's that's really neat. And um, if if you think about this next chapter, the book, uh, the founder of the learning moment. What what are the types of organisations that you're most looking forward to working with? Is it a particular industry segment, or are you very agnostic to who you you get out there and support? I want to work with successful leaders who want to get better. <laughs> I, I I I can't. You know, I'm not in the business of of doing you know rehabilitation. And I want to work with organizations that truly believe that having a high will of the people in their organization will create a better outcome. And let me just put that in simplistic terms. Yeah. You know, we, we can all write a great strategic plan, Dave, right? Yeah. Let's write the plan. Let's take it over to Harvard somewhere and give it to a really smart professor and say, mark up my strategic plan. He says, very fine, very fine strategic plan there, Dane. You get 60 out of 100 for your strategic plan. You know, most of them are 50 50. You got 60. So, thank you. I'm going to do work on that. Yeah. So, you take the strategic plan back to your organization. However, only 30% of your people who come to work every day are engaged, which means they are going to work towards that purpose. 30 times 60, I think, is what, about 1,800? Yeah. What about if 80% of your people were engaged and came to work every day in, 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 and they were enthusiastically dedicating themselves to a purpose bigger than themselves, they were learning something new, they were being set free and, and protected by a compelling set of values and you went out happy. I think 80 
times 60 is much bigger than 30 times 60. Yeah. So it all comes back to the fact it's all about the will of the people. And as Aristotle said, yeah. pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. Yeah, I, I, I really like I liked the maths, um, particularly for the engineers that are listening in and saying, oh, yeah, I get that. Because a lot of people talk about HR and employees and they find that it's fluffy, but there, there's a formula that that's pretty clear. <laughs> Simple. Yeah. If you have more people, more enthusiastic about achieving what you want to achieve, you're going to have a better outcome. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. And I think this, I've been talking to a few different people. Engagement, unfortunately, it's been such a buzzword for a while. It has got to associated with pizzas and ping pong tables. Um, I've been using a word a lot and I'm seeing a word out there in the press a lot more about empowerment and I think that comes back to your four pillars. And I heard you use the word bravery a few times, bravery to care, bravery to be candid, bravery to be accountable, bravery to be responsible. It's going to take brave leaders because traditionally the power has been held in the center and we haven't invited many people into the business to, to have a real role if we're really honest with ourselves. And I think there's a lot of companies out there. I liked how you said you don't want to help people with rehab. There's a lot of companies out there that are not comfortable and may not get comfortable with inviting their employees into um, an honest way of how we're going to run the business and grow and how we want to hear from them and how we want them to make decisions out in the fringes. Um, so I, I sense that that's probably going to be the, the biggest kind of force on which companies are going to be successful in the future of teamwork and which companies aren't, who's, who's brave enough to... Uh, embrace the high will of the people. Well, they they will go extinct. Yeah. They're, they're dinosaur companies. Yeah, and that's why I call it the will of the people. You know, you, you people empowerment is is a great word too. Engagement, but it is mm-hmm. how what's what's the outcome? Creating high will of the people. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I think that's a really. Strong note to end on, Gary. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, and thank you for taking the time to, to share your story and your experiences. It's, it's a, a very successful one. I'm excited for the next chapter. And uh, perhaps if people do want to reach out to you, those, those successful leaders that are looking to go and uh, keep building on, on success, how do they best reach you? So um, you can go to my website, www.thelearningmoment.net. Yeah. Um, you can email me at gary at the learning moment.net. That's G A R R Y two R's at the learning moment.net. Or please follow me on LinkedIn yeah. because I, I share a lot of uh, uh, my scar tissue on LinkedIn. So um, please just uh, search me on LinkedIn and follow me on LinkedIn and I get messages and my, I always answer my messages. So. No, that's neat, Gary. And thanks again for using the word scar tissue because I love it when you get successful leaders on the show that talk in a very candid way about how they got here and what they've gone through and that it's normal to have these learning moments along the way. That's that's life, man. That's sexy yeah. life. Always great to be with another Aussie. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> it makes me feel a little homesick seeing the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the background. There it is. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome.